Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Thank you for joining us this morning, Friday. Following up from our discussion yesterday, uh, you may recall yesterday we looked at the apology, contextualized the apology. We went through the text and we explored the way that uh, Socrates mounted his defense uh, at the trial that he was uh, convened to in 399. We saw that uh, against the charges, you may recall the charges, corruption of the youth uh, and blasphemy against the gods, that uh, Socrates constructed a a defense that consisted of two things. The first part of his defense consisted of essentially an explanation of why it was that he was on trial, this idea that he was there because of his reputation, not because he had done anything wrong. And in that first part, he lays out the very famous elaboration of what we now call Socratic wisdom, that idea that the wisdom, uh, the greatest wisdom that we have is that we are not wise. So we, we went through that. And then we saw that there's what I call this fulcrum of the text. There's a point where the text pivots. And uh, in the second part, then, of his his defense, Socrates turns the argument around, and the accused becomes the accuser, and he puts Athens on trial, accusing the city, essentially, of not behaving in a just way. Uh, And you may recall from from that discussion that he says to the men of Athens, he says, you men of Athens, uh, if you were to be judged, uh, you may recall the sexist phrase. He said, "If a foreigner were to come to the city, they would think they would they would they they would think they would have stumbled upon a city run by women." The the argument there, or the insult there, being that women were not allowed to participate in public life and were deemed to have less capacity for reason. So we saw then yesterday in this in the in the laying out of of Socrates' defense that it involves those those two elements. In the second part, however, we saw there's a complication in the way that Socrates seems to describe the obligation that he owes to himself as somebody who is committed always to act within the principles of justice, while at the same time belonging to an Athenian political society. And we looked at the, uh, the paradox of how he describes his behavior when he is called upon to assist in the arrest of Leon from Salamis, Leon the Salaminian, in which he says to his accusers, to the jury of Athens, when I was called to do a task that I, I, I thought to be unjust, I refused to carry it out. And then what did he do? What was his bold action? Do you remember? He went home, home, right? Like, I don't like this. I'm taking my toys and going home. So the question that it raises is, how do we then reconcile the duty of the citizen to act in accordance with what is just, while also acting in a way that serves the public good? Is it, in fact, serving the public good if, in the face of injustice, you simply go home? And so that's the paradox, I think, that we're left with in that, in that second part, is to what are the duties that, um, that, uh, that we should link to this question of uh, Socratic citizenship. You may recall that it also leads to this uncomfortable conclusion that activity or being active in public political life is incompatible with being just, <coughs> that politics or that the practice of politics leads inevitably to injustice. And that is his great attack then against the Athenians, that their city-state is fundamentally unjust. In the context of when this is taking place, of course, there's a resonance there, which is to say that the capitulation of the city of Athens is not because Socrates himself had uh, corrupted the youth or blasphemed against the gods. In fact, the capitulation of Athens can then be seen as a result of Athens having betrayed its fundamental promise to itself to be a city of what he called justice and strength, wisdom and uh, strength. Let's turn our attention then to the Crito, which is a, a, a linked dialogue uh, to the Apology. It's a very short dialogue. Very quickly, the Crito takes place after the events of the trial. So as we know, Socrates is found guilty, and then the decision of the Athenian jury is that he be condemned to death. He is, he is uh, sentenced to drink a poisoned, uh, a poisoned cup, a, a cup of hemlock as it is, so a cup of poison. And so uh, there's a period there between his sentencing and the actual execution, and he's put in prison. And during this period when he is in prison, one of his friends comes to him, his name is Crito, with a plan basically to get him out, right? It's like, we, me and a bunch of your friends, we put together this plan, and we're going to rescue you, save you from this execution. And their plan basically is, as I recall, uh, they're going to get a boat, and they're going to rescue him, going to get him out of the prison through like a rope, he's going to drop himself down in the boat, and they're going to take him away, and they're going to 
uh, take him off to some island where he can live out his days. And so there's a dialogue that takes place between Socrates and Crito, in which Crito tries to convince Socrates that he should, in fact, escape from prison, that it is the right thing to do. And over and against that, Socrates lays out a counterclaim in which he, lay, in which he explains why he feels it better that he, in fact, um, submit himself to the judgment of the court. And that's the sort of substance of the Crito. We don't need to spend too much time on this text, but it is worth noting, noting the key argument that Socrates, that Socrates raises. Crato's argument, I think, is actually a very good one. Socrates had children very late in life, and Crito comes to him and says, you have an obligation to escape. And the obligation you have is as a father, as a father to your children, you owe it to them to save your life so that they don't grow up as orphans, as they, so they can grow up with a father. And if you weren't prepared to meet that obligation, you shouldn't have had children in the first place. In other words, that by having children, you create, if you will, this kind of parental obligation. He says, if you, if you do not escape, they will meet with the usual fate of orphans. No, uh, no thanks to you. No man should bring children into the world who is unwilling to persevere to the end in their nurture and education. That's about as good an argument, I think, as you can create to explain why Socrates has an obligation not just to himself. This is not about just saving himself. This is about doing something for others, namely the family that he has. That he has. Uh, Socrates then says, well, that's a very good argument. So let me consider this argument, right? And the question then is, how do I sort through the obligations that I, Socrates, owe, right? That's the question that's raised in, in the Crito. And he recognizes that he, as a father, has obligations to his children. The question then becomes, is that the fundamental obligation that he owes? We might put it another way. Are you licensed? Do you have the license to do anything you want if it is in the name of protecting your children, right? Does that essentially trump all the other obligations that you, uh, that you have? And in this case, were Socrates to escape, what would he be doing? What would he be contravening? What would he be going against? The laws of the city in which he lives. So essentially, another way of thinking about the question is, do we have the right to break the law in order to protect our children? That's essentially the dilemma that Socrates, that Socrates puts before us. What do we think of that? Do parents have the right to essentially do whatever they need to do in order to protect their children? Would it be moral to kill somebody else, to, somebody else's children to save your own? Uh, your children are the most important thing in your life, so sometimes in order to save them, you might, the means, what is it, what's the phrase, the, the means of, The means justify the ends. The means justify the ends. So, so you would be on Crito's side. Your fundamental obligation is to your children, don't have children if you're not willing to carry out what you need to do in order to protect them, yeah. But to kill another human being or the children of your life, then that's moral um, law. <laughs> Killing children is never a good idea. I think we can. I think everybody in this room can get on that page, right? A world of child killers acting in their own view as moral agents is probably not a world we want to live in. So Socrates addresses this by essentially, and it's very clever, or Plato, I should say. I mean, this is again another Platonic dialogue in which Socrates appears as the main character, as we noted yesterday. Plato was Socrates' student, so the degree to which what we're reading is Platonic thinking voiced through Socrates or Socratic thinking reflected by Plato is unclear. But either way, the way in which then this question is taken up is that Socrates imagines a dialogue between himself and another interlocutor, another speaker. Does anybody, has anyone read the text? Remind us who, who, who Socrates has this dialogue with in his head, this imaginary dialogue. Socrates on one side. It's the laws that he has. He imagines the laws, right? Because if you think about it, if he were to escape prison, what is he disobeying? He is disobeying the law. Therefore, in order to elaborate or enlighten this question, he needs to have a conversation with that thing in which he will then transgress, namely the law. So he imagines this conversation with the law. And he then casts, or he asks the question, what is the relationship of an individual with respect to the law. What does law do for us as people? If you live in a world of law, so for example, if you're living in the city-state of Athens, which is governed by a set of codes and laws and rules and so on, what do those codes and laws and rules do for you? And essentially, they act as what? 
They act as a way to guide your behavior, right? They set out limits, what you can and what you cannot do. They create a framework that defines the kinds of actions that you can take. And Socrates sees then the relationship between somebody living under the law and the law itself as equivalent to the relationship of who? Parent and child. That the laws serve essentially almost in loco parentis, in the place of a parent, in the sense that the duty or the obligation of a parent is to protect and guide her children. Similarly, the role of law is to protect and guide the citizens who live within it. The purpose of law, presumably, is or seeks to maximize justice for the people who live under its regime. And so the law essentially serves in this kind of parental capacity. So that's the first point that he makes, that law has this almost parental role over us in the, insofar as it establishes guidelines, rules, frameworks, and indeed a framework for protection, just as uh, a parent would establish over her own children. The second question then is, which of those relationships is more important, the relationship of law to citizens or the relationship of citizen to child? Since they're the same relationship, right? Since, in other words, the relationship between the law and the citizen is the same relationship as that of a citizen with her own children, Essentially, what you're asking is a question of magnitude. Where is, the, where is the larger moral urgency? Is the larger moral urgency the citizen protecting her own parents or the citizen to respect her own laws? And in this regard, it's essentially a question of, you might say, to, to simplify it, which is, the, which is the more important parental authority, right? Which is the more important source of authority? The rules and laws that govern us create frameworks for our behavior and protect us, or the individual framework that we create simply by the act of having children. And as Socrates argues, in the, or as he has the law state, right, that the, uh, that the relationship that is created between law and the citizen is in fact the more important one because it protects everyone. It is a covenant that extends to all citizens because it gives essentially a framework that all of us must adhere to, whereas that of a single parent towards her children is an individual relationship, right? So in other words, the law is a greater parent, if you will, to all of us, as opposed to uh, your relationship with your own children. If I, as a parent, violate the law in order to honor the obligation that I owe my own children, what is the world that I am essentially creating for my children to live in? It is a world without law. Is that the world that I want for my own children? Is that what, good, is what is good for them, right? And he has the law lay out this essentially covenant, an agreement, right? A sacred agreement that is entered into. But there is essentially a covenant then between, on the one hand, law, and on the other hand, the citizen, or in this case, Socrates. He says, he has the law, he, Socrates says literally, the laws will say, consider Socrates if this is true, that in your present attempt, you are going to do us wrong, meaning if you escape, you will do us, the laws, wrong. You will contravene the law. For after having brought you into the world and nurtured and educated you and given you and every other citizen a share in every good that we had to give, we further proclaim and give the right to every Athenian that if he does not like us when he has come of age and he has seen the ways of the city and made our acquaintance, if he does not like it, he may go where he pleases and take his goods with him. So in other words, you grow up in this system of laws. If at a certain point you choose you don't like them, right? you have, Socrates says, and this is true in the ancient Greek context, you have the opportunity to leave. right? You can absent yourself from that system of laws and go move or go live somewhere else. If you choose not to do so, what essentially have you done? right? If you would choose, in other words, to live according to this set of laws, as he says, he who has experience of the manner in which we order justice and administer the state and yet you still stay in that state, has entered into an implied contract that he will do as we command him. So in other words, to live in a society of laws is to live according to an implied contract to follow those laws. And if you reject the contract, you should leave. Now, it's true that in our modern context, if, for example, you're sitting here in this classroom and for whatever reason you decide you don't want to live according to the laws that we have promulgated and established, you may not have the option simply to get up and leave, right? I'm not sure you can just walk up to Andorra uh, and say, okay, I choose to live, live here now because we control. In the absence of being able to leave, if you don't like the law, what should you do? 
If you don't like the laws as they are written, what should you do in the context of a democracy? Go home. Go home? No. <laughs> well, yes, maybe. Yeah, you should change them, right? Persuade us that our laws are wrong. As he says a little bit later on in the dialogue, that if you live in according to the laws and you've been unable to persuade us differently, then you are essentially bound by covenant to the terms that those laws establish. He says, there is an entered into an implied contract that he will do as we command him. And he who disobeys us, as we maintain, is wrong in three ways. First, because in disobeying us, the laws, he is disobeying his parents. Disobeying the law is like disobeying your parents, disobeying that which creates the guidelines, the frameworks for nurturing and protecting you. Secondly, because we are the authors of his education, law is what teaches us what we can and cannot do, right? How we should behave, what are the frameworks that govern our actions. Thirdly, because he has made an agreement with us that he will duly obey our commands, and yet he neither obeys them nor convinces us that our commands are wrong. So you have the choice, obey, or if you're not convinced, to try to convince, and if you're unsuccessful, you simply are left with the necessity to follow the law. The follow, the, what follows from this then, right? If you are in this world of an implied contract, what would a world look like if everyone became their own moral judges, their own moral arbiters, and decided which laws they chose to follow and which laws they chose to reject? Would you live in a world of law? Is that a world of law? What makes law count for something? The very fact that it applies to all people whether it serves your immediate needs or not. Because if you end up in a situation where everyone can decide, well, I don't like this law, but I do like that one, so on and so forth, does that create a functional society? Does that create the kind of society that you want to live in? And more importantly, does it create the society that you want your children to grow up in? And so then it comes back essentially to the same point. If you care about the welfare of your children, you will fundamentally want them not to grow up in some environment of anarchy where everyone can do whatever they want. Instead, you will want for them to grow up in a society of laws. If, therefore, you want your children to grow up in a society of laws, what is your fundamental obligation that you owe them? To follow the law, right? To do as the law commands. For to do differently is not just harmful to you, but also harmful to then those that you have brought into this world. And so he goes through this argument, and at the end, Crito says, okay, you're right. He says, uh, listen then, Socrates, to us who have brought you up, think not of life and children first and of justice afterwards, but of justice first, and then everything will follow. So essentially, in the dialogue of the Crito, it's a way of putting forth this idea that from this principle of justice, or insofar as laws reflect justice, all other things follow. And so therefore, our obligation primarily is to a world that is in correspondence with our understanding of what is just. And when there are instances where things that are happening to us seem to be incompatible with our sense of what justice means, this nonetheless does not give us the license to contravene the very basis upon which that law rests. We do not have that option because we are bound by this implicit contract. This is, I think, the very first iteration of what's called social contractarianism, which is obviously made much more famous by people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau in a book entitled The Social Contract, but is elaborated much more formally by Hobbes, who we'll be reading in a couple of weeks. But we see it here in the Crito expressed first by Socrates as part of this kind of larger climate that surrounds uh, that surrounds the apology. And so that's why I think the Crito is important for us because, it, it good, first of all, it's a good example of the sort of Socratic environment, a very good argument which raises important questions that are not easy to answer and that therefore require us to think carefully very or very carefully through the, uh, through the implications. And then it arrives perhaps at some unexpected results that, in fact, your obligations as a parent to your children are secondary to your obligations as a citizen because it thereby springs the principles of justice that you must want for your children as a responsible parent.